So Einstein has this quote, which is play is the highest form of research. And I really took that to heart. I was like, I am going to play. And this is how I'm going to learn about robotics. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson, and welcome to the Create the Future podcast, brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Today's guest is both a scientist and a ballerina who is increasingly turning to engineering as part of her work. Born in the US, Dr. Merritt Moore has a degree in physics from Harvard, a PhD in atomic and laser physics from the University of Oxford, and has performed on stage with the English National Ballet and the Zurich Ballet, among other companies. Not surprisingly, considering her background, Merritt, who is now based in Dubai, wants to break down stereotypes between disciplines and is currently combining robotics with her love of dance. Merritt, first of all, when did you get the idea to use robots with your dance? It definitely got spurred on by this pandemic because I couldn't dance with humans and was looking for a companion. And then was like, well, robots can't get COVID, so let's dance with the robots. The timing worked out because I had just been invited as an artist in residence at Harvard Art Lab. So I'd literally spent January, February before the pandemic working with an industrial robotic arm. I have a physics background, so I've always been curious to see if there is a way to merge both the arts and science in a way that I felt enhanced both. And having watched this documentary, AlphaGo, where I saw an AI machine beat a human at the game of Go, which is an incredibly intricate game, the commentary around it were experts saying, wow, the AI machine showed like a really creative way to move, like it was out of the box. It's something that no human had done in 2000 years. This game has existed for 2000 years. And they're like, it's doing moves that no one's ever seen before. And I just thought, interesting, like, I think there's a way that technology can be merged to enhance human creativity and to open our eyes to new possibilities. And so that's, that's how it all began. It still seems an unusual leap to go from a game that has admittedly so much complexity and effectively mathematics involved with it to dance because dance, yes, there are a myriad of ways in which a dancer can move their body, which would be very different to a non-dancer. But then you'd also think there are actually only a finite ways of being able to move your body. Well, the first question I had when I was watching that documentary, and then I, I read up a, or I started learning more about AI. And for instance, there's these GANs, generative adversarial networks, where you input images and it combines the images to a different output. So for instance, you would say, oh, I want 30% bird, 30% water, 40% sky or something. And it'll output this weird combination of the three via AI and machine learning. And so I always thought, interesting, like I'm ballet trained. I've danced with a number of ballet companies. So my expertise lies in ballet. But for instance, my sister, she does hip hop and she's done crew and their formations are so unique and different. And I've had experience with flamenco and salsa and hip hop, but I don't have that same expertise that I do with ballet, you know, and trained in ballet and been in ballet companies where it's like eight to 18 hours a day and training the body. I thought, how interesting would it be if you could use these generative adversarial networks and say, oh, I want a piece. Give me something that's 30% hip hop, 30% ballet, 30% flamenco, 10% like pedestrian. And it gives a new way to find like new choreography, new ways of moving. I think sometimes ballet is so elegant and beautiful and pure, but I think the formations are freaking boring, to be honest, right? Like, oh, we're going to do a line now, a diagonal line. Oh, a circle, <laughs> you know, like, ooh, like two parallel lines. But in hip hop, it's like they're together and then they're up in the air and it's like the formations are amazing. And I've always been interested in creativity. 
I've always asked, is it nature? Is it nurture? How do you cultivate creativity? How to elicit more creativity in students? I think if you use technology, if you use AI, it doesn't take away the human element. I think it enhances it and allows us to learn and be more creative much faster. How does the robot then capture the movement of your body? Is it rather like Hollywood with a, a leotard and a few sensors? So there are multiple ways. I can go into a motion capture suit, exactly what you're describing, where there are sensors on the ceiling and you're in a suit with little detectors all over the body. And then the way that you move is then stored as data in the computer. This is sort of exploring, ah, okay, can that data be fed to machine learning, where it then tweaks it and re-choreographs in a new way that you can then map onto the robot and dance with. That's one project we're working on. The second project is, can I use the handset of a VR? When I move my arm, the robot imitates it instantaneously. So it can follow my movement. What's fun is that we're kind of exploring like, how can we make it instantaneous and it still be very safe? So when I do performances, live performances now, and at some of my social media, I've pre-programmed it. So I know where it's going to go so that it's choreographed. But I think it is an interesting question, which is one that I really want to explore more this year. Can we figure out a way that I can improvise with the robot where it's not choreographed in a way that, for instance, I don't worry that it's going to hit my head, you know, if I'm dancing next to it, which would kind of be the concern right now. Like if it just started doing whatever it wanted, it can go fast, right? And I'd be like, I don't want to stand right next to it. Where in a lot of my videos and a lot of my performances, I am standing next to it, but because I have trust and faith that I know where it's going to go. And are you using the robots as a tool or learning about how they work as you go along? Are you involved in the programming as well or building them to do exactly what you want to do? Yeah, so I program everything. I've also collaborated, for instance, uh, Jose Luis at Harvard, and I've collaborated with people in India who then continue push it further in terms of AI. That's the fun part of this is I've been in a physics lab for years, and I felt that in academia, there's so much pressure to publish papers in order to make it, quote unquote. And so what would happen is I was in quantum optics. If you do an experiment with four photons, the next person does it with five photons and the next person does it with six. It's not very creative. So after my PhD, I felt, oh, I'm going to take a different path. So Einstein has this quote, which is play is the highest form of research. And I really took that to heart. I was like, I am going to play. And this is how I'm going to learn about robotics. Now you're merging the engineering to sort of play a, a larger role in your research. Was that deliberate or was it just coming out of this, realizing that you wanted to play and you needed to incorporate engineering into this? They're just married together, I would say. It's just constantly like following the questions that come from it. So for instance, like art is everywhere, math is everywhere, engineering is everywhere. I just remember my mom would say like, I didn't talk much as a kid, but she just remembers me like looking out the window and then just being like, math is everywhere. So <laughs> I think in the same sense, I'm like, yeah, you know, engineering is such a big, it's necessary, right? It's the fusion at the intersection of both science and art. Absolutely. And do you humanize your robots? So right now, like when I work, this is like an industrial robotic arm. It has no legs. It has no arms. I love it because it's for me, it feels like a puzzle trying to figure out how to dance with it. Inevitably, people do humanize it, right? It's a, instantly, it has a name. Most of the guys see it as a girl and most of the girls see it as a guy. Like, it's just, it's just curious. It's interesting. It doesn't really technically have a face, but people see a face on it and they see emotion and they feel it. The research says that majority of our communication is nonverbal and majority of that is body language. And so I've always kind of been curious, you know, in order to communicate with body language, do you need a human body form or can it be this industrial robotic arm? But and I play around with different shapes and forms and different robots, so we shall see. 
That's a really interesting connection, actually, and none that I'd not made before in this non-verbal communication and that connection between robots and the human body. And, and dance is the ultimate form of non-verbal communication. You mentioned that you had not spoken much when you were younger. Is is that why you were drawn to dance, perhaps? I think so. And perhaps physics as well. I was like, equations and body movement, we are good. And my parents said, like, I was expressive, but not with words. Like, they understood what I needed or wanted or was feeling. But I think I always used my body. I used my hands. I used my expression. And so when I found dance, which was late at 13, I think it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, it was just, it felt so raw, authentic and true. Whereas with words, I think I always felt like I could say something, but it doesn't really encapsulate the full meaning that I'm trying to express. And I mentioned about stereotypes earlier on, and, and obviously you've you've broken those stereotypes by being both a professionally trained ballerina and a physicist. How do people react to that? Because it's such an unusual combination. I don't think I've ever heard it before. It's been a journey. I've had wonderful mentors, but I think for them, they were saying, look, if I wanted to be a professional ballet dancer what am I doing doing physics? And if I wanted to be a physicist, what was I doing doing so much dance? And there's so many times in which I tried to quit and just focus on one. And it just, it didn't work. Like I stopped dancing and I quit dancing and my grades dropped and my energy level dropped and my productivity dropped. If I just focus on dance, like I get injured or I'm not as happy and I get a bit critical of myself in the studio. So it was a mix of, I didn't think I was going to make it because everyone said it was possible, but there was something deep, deep within me that was like, but maybe, what if, can I do it? So it was hard, hard work for at least seven years and more, but it was seven years of hard, hard work where I didn't know if it was going to work out. And I didn't know if I would make it to a ballet company and I didn't know if I would then actually be able to graduate in physics and go to a PhD. So that was the hardest part is the hard work is hard, obviously, but the hardest part is doing the hard work for many, many years and not knowing if it's going to work out. And what do you think the benefits are to breaking down these stereotypes? Well, one is, I mean, there needs to be a huge emphasis and push and I think a celebration of creativity and imagination. I don't think anyone is happy with the education system. And a a large part is because it's focused on everyone answering questions in a very specific way, right? It's these multiple choice questions or it's these exams. And it's like, you need to answer questions and you need to get them right or you're wrong. But every AI is going to be able to answer any question super fast. For me, it's like, we can't compete with that. But what humans have that those machines will never have is that creative imaginative aspect. So it's our ability to ask questions. So instead of focusing on answering questions, I think we need to learn how to ask questions, which is is what research is about, what engineering is about, what all of that is about. But sometimes I think it's missing. I think Einstein, you know, he imagined himself as a photon on a light beam and he came up with special relativity. He didn't know the math. He then learns the math and has a friend, buddy, help him in order to write it out in math to persuade his colleagues. But unfortunately, the way it's taught is, you know, here's the math equation, memorize it, regurgitate it. Here's the test. Here's the exam. Thinking about imagining yourself on a photo (laughs) is such a brilliant, brilliant notion. You can't imagine why it wouldn't be taught. I'm going to move to just a, a short period ago in the past because... In 2017, you took part in the BBC television series, Astronauts, Do You Have What It Takes? And you had uh, a former NASA astronaut, Chris Hadfield, as one of the presenters. It was fairly stringent in terms of, you know, the tasks that they made you do. What did you learn from taking part in that series? What did you take away from it? It was the most exhilarating and challenging experience I've ever 
gone through. In the first day we show up and they're like, okay, one by one, go into the helicopter and hover it. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, it, they, they were going all in and we had to be in capsules that were dunked in water and flipped upside down and we had to break free of that and they flew us to Germany to go on the simulator that astronauts had used to dock the Soyuz to the International Space Station. I mean, it was so intense. I think it raised the bar for myself and have such respect for astronauts in a way that I think you really sort of only appreciate if you're going through those trials and challenges that they throw at you. But also there's such teamwork that's required and focus. Yeah, but it also showed me, I was like, I want to go to space. (laughs) I was going to ask you that. Have you a thought of applying to be an astronaut? Yeah, I applied for NASA. And that's why also I'm learning the robotics and becoming an expert in it, because I do believe that's the future in space. For me, it you know, I have the physics background, I have the dance physical aspect, and I just want that robotics expertise as well. And Yusaku Mazawa, who is a Japanese billionaire who bought a flight to go around the moon to bring eight artists with him. So they publicly announced that I was one of the shortlist. That should be announced, I don't know, sometime in the next year. And you're part of this Women in Physics mentoring program and you started this SASTAS, which is Science Art Sisters, trying to help younger girls have, you know, an interest in STEM. Would you advise engineers to be more visible? Oh, certainly. I also would say, like, there's no rush to do it either because, you know, it does sometimes take time. But I think no engineer should ever hide it. It's such a gift for them to share what they're learning and to share the projects they're working on. Like that's the part that makes it tangible and real and inspiring. I was kind of a mole underground (laughs) just doing my thing for at least 10 years before there was any publicity or recognition of it. I liked that because... You know, some things take time. Sometimes you just work at it. Then you can pop your head up when it's worked out. Is this also why you co-founded Sci Art Party, which is this sort of interdisciplinary collaboration and education networking also includes a podcast. And I love the fact that I looked at the website and the people who are involved all do all sorts of different things but it was the fact that you had a 12 year old website team leader (laughs) I had to read twice to make sure I'd actually read it correctly I mean she was amazing she still is little hazel at 12 years old she was she was on it she's telling us all what to do (laughs) yeah it it happened during this pandemic with my co-founder Monse where I think we realized you know we're all isolated it was at the beginning of the pandemic people were lonely and kind of low on hope. And we just did these events, um, what we thought would be mini events, just to be like, okay, well, we're all stuck at home. Let's meet the other sci artists, like those who are interested in science or art or both. And we had like 250 people sign up the first day, which I was like, I didn't know there were so many. I think I was expecting, I don't know, like 20 max. And so I had Chris Hadfield come on, astronaut Chris Hadfield, and he played for us and Space Odyssey, which was so great. And then uh, we had Neil deGrasse Tyson as well come on. It sounds as if the pandemic had an enormous effect on you. Yes. Yeah. But I, I think that's the good thing about challenges. I mean, not that I would wish pandemic again, but challenges in general, I think, force questions, right? And that's what leads to breakthroughs. And what would your advice be to engineers, young engineers in particular, who do have this creative side? And funnily enough, I wasn't as surprised as you when you said you've got 250 people sort of joined up because I obviously through my work interview a lot of engineers and scientists and if anything I'd be surprised if I don't meet an engineer or a scientist 
who hasn't got a creative side because they're all musicians or do art or, you know, they're very creative. I really believe like passion is the magic, right? It just brings light and fun and makes work not feel like work. It also brings appreciation. Like, don't get me wrong. Like there are times when I was doing physics, I was just, this is not working. <laughs> this is terrible. But then it made me really appreciate when I was in the studio and with music and like dancing around. I'm like, oh, I'm not over a lab table. But then also vice versa, there are times when I am training and I have bloody toes and I am sore and I do not want to move. And it really makes me appreciate just sitting in a library with a physics book. It enhances that appreciation. I think appreciation is the key for success and happiness. So I think one aspect is don't let that go. And then number two, I would say is particularly for engineers, give it time in your own time and in in your own way. I think there are a lot of ways that science and engineering is taught that perhaps isn't one's way of learning it. I'll just touch on it, but I think it's one of the reasons why there aren't as many women in physics and engineering and science is because I personally have never had a textbook written by a woman. I've had a mentor, but not a professor or teacher who is female in physics. And I think that they're just specific ways it's taught that I don't think is everyone's way of learning it. So I would say learn it in your own way, which for me was I would go into a lecture and pretend like I was teaching other people the way that I wanted it to be taught. I think there's lots of very good advice there, particularly in relation to time and also going back to what you said earlier about playfulness is don't forget to be playful. Dr. Merritt Moore, thank you so much for joining us on the Create the Future podcast. Thank you. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or visit qeprize.org. Thanks for listening and join me again next time. Thank you.